recording or whether they're uh, not recording, uh, my demeanor, my actions is not going to change because of the cameras on me. You know, um, I'm gonna conduct my business the way I need to conduct it. Um, you know, the, the cameras is uh, it's it's not a threat to me. They can record all they want. I mean, we're we're there to do our job, and, and you know that's their right to record it. So it's it's no point of us getting mad because the the camera is not even an issue of why we stop them, or it's it's not even gonna be a, a come apart of it. So as long as you you know, maintain your professionalism and do what you're taught. You know, the camera shouldn't even be an issue. Right. But at the same time, if the camera takes over the stop, then we have a problem. What do you mean by that? If I stop you, then in my mind, I believe I have a reason to stop you. So there's a series of questions that I'm going to ask you, and I expect an answer. Whether I like the answer or not, I expect an answer in return. But if we can't get to the question that I'm asking, because you're so busy telling me that you're recording me, and I got you, and I got your badge. Okay, good, now can I have your license? I need that. Because without that, we can't go any further, and now I'm gonna to have to go a different direction if we can't get past the fact that we both have cameras. So something like that will escalate it. It will certainly escalate You're asking for a license. I got my camera, I got you. I see you, Officer Johnson. I got your badge number, I, got, I know my rights. I know my rights, and you're saying, It's always, in that com it's always in that, that comment uh, when you ask for that for license and information that you need. Uh, one thing I do like about when someone does have a camera, what does that have their hands doing? The okay. Okay. You see they're their not, hands. They're you know not see your hands. Okay. And they're occupied. They're not reaching for weapon because you're holding the camera. You're, you're taking it. It's fine. Sometimes we may make an accident and not and forget to turn on our camera, which is something we, we have to pay for. But if you're videotaping, hey, that kind of covers me too. All right, let's, let's, well, I know the chief wants to answer question number two. So I'm, we're going to go right straight to question number two. Um, why has deadly force been used instead of tasers when suspects are unarmed? Tasers came out a number of years ago. And um, it, it's just like body cam. Everybody thought this was the panacea to not using uh, lethal force. It's called less lethal force is a taser. Um, but I need to put the taser in its proper perspective. In order for an officer to use a taser, he has to be in a tactically advantageable advantage situation. Let me give an example. We had a guy not too long ago, and, and not being unarmed, he was armed. He had a knife. And Remember that movie where the guy said, that's not, he was, he was Australian, he said, that's not a knife, this is a knife, and he pulled out the big boat. Yeah, it was one of those. He gets out of the car, and he wanted, it, this was what we call the case of uh, suicide by cop. He, he was coming after the officers, he had his knife. Well, there were three cops there. Two drew down with their weapons on the, to cover deadly force. That's what you do if someone has a knife. The third officer had the taser. He was able to use the taser. The individual went down. He still had a knife in his hand, but he was incapacitated. They then disarmed him. I think he wound up with a broken thumb uh, at the end of the case. But they did not have to use deadly force. So tasers are used in a lot of situations like that. We have had, and I'm, I've been counting since the end of May. Um, sometime in May, there was a, a poem written in the Virginia pilot. And one of the lines on the poem said, trigger happy cops everywhere. And, and I kind of, you know, he asked about how we feel. I kind of took that a little personal because that's not the case. So we're now tracking what we call cases where we did not use the deadly force. We used less lethal, light tasers, a baton, or, or an OC spray. And we're up to about 17 cases where we did not have to use deadly force, where perhaps we could have. Not all officers carry tasers yet. They will be, as each uh, academy class now goes through the academy, we purchase a taser for every officer. Now they're about $800 a piece, so they're, they're, it's not an inexpensive piece of equipment. And the tasers are carried, what we call cross draw, so that you know that there's my taser on this side, my weapon's on this side, so there's not an accident where I thought I was going for my taser, but I used my weapon. Unarmed individuals, uh, 
you know, there's an unarmed individual and then there's an unarmed individual. I'm an average sized man. If, if I have to, first of all, if I have to arrest someone who's much larger than me, I'm, I've been around the block long enough, I get on the radio first and say, get me a couple additional units here so we maybe uh, can work this through. But if it goes to physical force, sometimes individuals go for an officer's gun, a struggle for a gun happens, someone's gonna get shot. But we use tasers um, a lot in our city. We have not had a case in a long, long time where an individual is unarmed. They're either armed with guns, the last four shooting incidents we've had, uh, the individual shot first at the officer. So we, we do use the taser when it's appropriate, but it's not the panacea. Just like, uh, as we, I know Norfolk is in the body cameras, and so Chesapeake, we're heading that direction. But you know that's not the fantasy because sometimes the camera falls off. Or sometimes during the struggle, all you see is, is, is a jumble. We're doing the best we can with less lethal force. And, and I wanted to lead into something else. Because uh, Andre down on the end has that CIT pin, and I've already mentioned it. We um, have 280 officers now in our police department specially trained in crisis intervention training. This has to do with individuals who, a lot of folks that we deal with are going through some kind of mental issue, right? I mean, they're just, at that moment in time, their mental capacity is not there. <clears throat> Captain Miller alluded to when I started as a cop, back in the older days, you would just immediately arrest the person for some kind of disorderly conduct. And it would usually wind up into a forceful situation because the person is not, does not have all their mental capacities at that time. Through CIT, these officers go through a lot of additional training on how to de-escalate the situation and divert the person from the criminal justice system to the mental health system if we can. The result is uses of force are down. The big result is our SWAT team use of force are down because officers on the street are able to um, fix the situation, if you will, solve the situation without having to call in the heavy hitters. So the original question is, can we use tasers on an unarmed subject? We do as many times as we can. There's going to come a time where if someone has me around the throat and, we're, and, and he's unarmed, but the, we're gonna have to go to deadly force. That's the rarity. Yeah, we have a case now, and I believe one of the other questions is the case down in Florida when the van was on his back with his arms up, they shot him in the leg. Everybody on this panel who looked at that, what do we all do? We hung our head and said, what did you do? We get it. We understand what's happening. Um, and again, same thing with Norfolk. We track every use of force case that we do in our city. Everything from just putting my hands on someone. If, if Ms. Felton, I'm gonna use you as an example, this would never happen. But if I had to arrest Ms. Felton, and all I had to do was grab her by the arm and put handcuffs on, we consider that a force. Okay, we are one of the few police departments in the country where if we point a weapon at someone, it's a use of force. Most police agencies say, only if you fire the weapon. No, if I pull my weapon and point it at you, do you think that's a forceful situation? Because I do. Because <laughs> in my head, I'm thinking this is gonna go to that other place. We're the only police department in, in the state, and I don't know about the rest of the country, if you point a taser at someone, I want it documented. The reason is that at the end of the year, we show, we point the tasers X number of times, but you know, so far, we've only used them six times. Because a lot of people realize when they see the taser come out, okay, it's, it's, time, it's time to give up. Um, and and it's, it's a coercion but we're able to make the arrest without using that amount of force. So I really wanted to hone in on this question about police use of force. Last year in our city, we answered about 200,000 calls for service. We either arrested or wrote a ticket to another 60,000 people. Um, and then we had, and I forget the number of, of field contacts. And then we go over all the use of force cases. In all of those cases, four individuals, um, Four out of, out of over a quarter million times went to the emergency room. One of those was for an incident that happened prior to us getting there, and the other three, one was an abrasion to the head, and um, the other two, the general, the, the individual, the suspect was armed with a weapon, and uh, the canine affected the arrest and taken to the hospital to make sure they're okay. So 
four times out of a quarter million, um, which is pretty good. So we've used the tasers. More officers will be getting the tasers. Just everybody remember that um, it's not the panacea to life because of the two biggest reasons we deal uh, with individuals <coughs> and cops are individuals. These young men and women have not perfected walking on water, so sometimes they're going to revert back to being a human, and that is, like you said earlier, to go home at one time. One final comment, because I said I do have to leave at 11, when we talked about interacting with the public, we had a, um, a fantastic rally up in Mount Trashmore about a month ago. Was, was anyone there? Fantastic rally. Uh, four, four or five hundred people up on the top of the mountain. On top of the mountain. How's that for a pro prophetic thing in the church? Everybody came off at one time and, and walked around the lake. I'm sorry? Yep. When everybody got to um, Independence Hollow Road area, that's where everybody stopped because the cars were beeping the horn. Everybody was having their, uh, uh, their sign. A lot of Black Lives Matter shirts were out on that day. And um, the event organizers got everybody, the event organizers got everybody out of the street back up on the sidewalk. From that point forward, Captain Miller was a rock star. Um, we were taking pictures. I have never been praying so much as I did during that, that particular next two hours. People, it was, it was, when I spoke to some of my colleagues around the country, they said, well, how was your rally? I said, it was a love fest. At the end of the night, we have a lot of public support. <clears throat> One final comment on that. Um, a while back, we, we were with another rally, and a young lady had a sign, and I told her I'm going to steal this idea. It says, strong communities make police obsolete. <laughs> you are a strong community. You're not going to make us obsolete. But I think we can get to the point that strong communities will make the cops not have to do three quarters of the job that they have to do. So I know it was long-winded, sir, but I wanted to answer that question about tasers, about use of force, about the training that they're given. Um, you know, the only thing I'm a little disappointed, I don't see a whole lot of young folks. Um, I tried to recruit the young man with the violin, but his mother said no. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Okay.